if I would ask you a couple questions, automatically your mind would do some things about what that word would mean. Um, and if I asked you the word prayer, wow, that's very powerful there, man. <laughs> that's powerful. I, I like that. The word prayer. Some of us would say something that I don't do very often. Some of us would go to a time where you needed to get a hold of God and you were on your face before God and God miraculously came through and delivered. Some of us would think, well, it's time I pray before I go to bed or I pray before I eat a dinner. But prayer, prayer has the potential to be the most powerful avenue that we have with expectancy of seeing God's work. Prayer with expectancy delivers power. The problem with prayer is sometimes we do not expect the prayer that we offer to have any power behind it, so it's idle words out of our mouth, and it becomes a duty that we do, and it's not a delight that we look forward to. Prayer. The expectancy of prayer should be powerful. When we get on our knees before God and we communicate to him, why? Why? Because we know that God is the only one that can deliver what I need. God, the almighty, powerful God that loves me, wants to talk to me. And it makes no difference how long you've been a believer. Whether you've been a believer for five days or 50 years, prayer sometimes can have a crippling effect on our spiritual condition. Sure, we come to church and we can do the corporate prayers and we can have somebody pray up here and we can say amen. But I believe what God truly wants for us is each and every one of his children to have a heart full of expectancy that he loves them and wants to deliver something for him. And that's what I believe we have. So why don't we pray? I wish I could say that my prayer life is defined by constant prayer, with audacious prayers and the power of God. But I am just like you. There's times that I'm tired and there's times that I get lazy. And there's times that I get busy and I put what the most important thing is off to the back burner till tomorrow. I struggle with slowing down long enough to pray and finding a quiet place and just enough time that I can quiet my spirit. And then sometimes when I pray, I just pray sometimes words to make people feel like I'm praying for them, but they're not words with expectancy within my soul. I struggle with being consistent and fervent in my prayer. See, when we struggle with these things and we're talking about the most powerful avenue that we have to get a hold of God, what we must do is we have to change the attitude of our prayer to authenticity of God looking at my heart and with expectancy of God changing my life. If we do not believe God can change, what we're doing is we're just wasting some time on our knees before God. I don't believe there has to be a posture of prayer. I believe God doesn't look at the way we bow or the way we bend or where we're driving or whether our eyes are open or our eyes are shut. I believe God looks deeper within that and he sees your heart. He sees what you need. And I believe God can tell with the expectancy within our prayer whether we believe God can actually change what you're praying for. Can God do great and mighty things? You know, there's a scripture found in Matthew chapter 6, verses 6 and 7. It says, And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Just praying long, devout prayers in the synagogues or out on the streets or when you're praying and you pray for 20 minutes. And I don't believe God thinks you're more spiritual when you pray longer. And I don't think God thinks you're not spiritual when you pray shorter. I think what God wants to do is I get, think God wants to see your heart and understand that you truly love him. Prayer is simply a conversation with God that is defined by faith it's a humble act of taking natural concerns to a supernatural God. Natural concerns to a supernatural God. When we look at that, 
We understand that God wants to have a relationship with us. And we need to have that expectancy with him and for him. We can always pray with expectancy because God always hears and answers. Our prayer, it, it, it may not be a yes, but it'll always be best whether we understand it or not. Now, I found this quote from Tim Keller and I thought this quote was wonderful. I want to say it twice, so grab this quote. God will either give you what we ask or he will give you what we would have asked if we know everything he knows. Is that true? God will either give us what we ask or he will give us what we would have asked if we knew everything he knows. Sometimes we do not get what we ask for because God knows we're not ready for that. He understands what the future is going to be like. He understands what you need. And just because God says no doesn't mean God's not a killjoy. It doesn't mean God doesn't like you. It means God knows what you need. And sometimes what we have to do is we have to just say, I have to trust God. I have to trust God on what we need. And it's tough. There are things that you want to get a hold of God for. There's things that you are dying on the inside and you just need God to answer that prayer. And you feel like God's not distant. You feel like he's not aware. You feel like you're alone. And God is sitting there all the time listening to every prayer of every righteous individual. And he wants to deliver us. But sometimes he has to take us where he needs us to go in order for him to deliver us. And the places sometimes he needs us to go, sometimes we are the ones that really don't want to go there. In Psalm chapter 77, verse 14, it says, You are the God who works wonders. You have made me known your might among the people. You are the God who makes wonders. You are the God that can change the world. You are the God that can take my life and let it change whoever I am to whoever you want me to be. All I have to do is I have to back off and let God do his work. One of the most important verses in the Bible is Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than we could ask or think according to the power at work within us. I think we have to team up the two words, prayer and power. We team up prayer and powerlessness. We team up prayer and sleeping boring, time-consuming. But when we team up prayer and power, prayer and expectancy, I expect God to do something great within my life. When we team those words up, we can have Colossians chapter 4, verse 2. Continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with all thanksgiving. Be earnest. I'm not going to quit. I am not going to stop. I am going to be vigilant. I am going to stand my ground. What is it that you need God to do? What is it in your prayer life that you can't get on your own? We need to pray with expectancy. We have people that are, that are lost in your family. Pray with expectancy. You have people going through drug issues. Pray with expectancy. Don't just lift their name up. Say, God, I need you to deliver them. I need them to have salvation. When we pray with expectancy and a vitality within our life, everything changes. Everything changes. But when we just say, uh, let us have a good day today at work. I pray that we get home safe. Blah, 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 blah. God wants us to pray with a fervent heart. God wants us to pray with some real conviction within our life. Prayer is a concern, a, a more concerned that what we can handle ourselves and we want to give that concern to a supernatural God that what we cannot do, he is expecting us to do. He's delivering us out of issues. When we have issues within our life, pray with expectancy, with power of God, that he will deliver everything that we cannot. So without expectancy and without power, I would say if you're like me, prayer is goes on the back shelf. Let's say, how many of you guys struggle with prayer? Let's just be honest. I'm your pastor. I struggle with prayer. Um, I don't want to. I pray all the time, but I still struggle with prayer. I struggle with prayer, not that the words that come out of my mouth, but the heart that the words come out of my mouth with. 
when I go to hospital bed, I, I'm concerned about that person that's laying in that bed. I'll kneel beside that bed, and I'll pray for them with all the conviction I have, and I love that person, and I want the best for that person. But somebody gives me a call and say, Will you give me a, can you pray for me? Yeah, I'll pray for you. And then I don't do it. That's a sin on my part. So sometimes when we say, I'll pray, we need to remember we've asked somebody to do something that they need us to do, and we have the power of God upon our lives. We must pray. So why is some of the things that we don't pray? We don't pray because we didn't pray. Well, that's deep, isn't it? We don't pray because we didn't pray. I don't know how to pray. I never prayed at the house growing up. The only time I said a prayer growing up is at the dinner time, and that prayer doesn't fit on all occasions. And I didn't pray to him last week, last month, last year. So because I didn't pray to him last week, last month, or last year, I'm kind of embarrassed. So it's easier for me not to pray than to pray, because then if I pray, then I'm going to say, uh, I, I know that you know me, but we haven't talked in a while, and uh, I'm apologizing. And you know what Jesus says then? Nice to hear from you. I've been waiting for you. I know that you haven't talked to me, but I've been working within your life, and you don't even realize it. And all he wants from us is, it's okay. I love you anyway. I want you. When guilt governs our actions, it leads to more guilt. But you don't leave avoiding prayer because you have been prayerlessness. You just need to own it. Just say, God, sorry. I haven't talked to you much. Actually, actually, he says, welcome back. Welcome home. In James chapter 4 verse 8, it says this, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Sometimes we don't pray because we just haven't been praying in the past. Sometimes we don't know how to pray. We've never prayed. We've never been taught how to pray. But this is supposed to be a house of prayer. So what we must do is we must pray. We must talk about prayer, understand what prayer is, understand how to pray. And sometimes we forget prayer is an invitation. Prayer is an invitation. It's the most understood by nature of prayer. Prayer is not a human attention to get God's attention. Some theologians say that the only reason we even think of God is because God is trying to get our attention. You can't get your life to Christ you can't be saved without Christ. Christ draws all of us to him. It is because of his drawing us to him that we have salvation. None of us are worthy of salvation, but Jesus said, I want you for salvation, and he draws all men unto himself. Every time somebody gives their life to Christ, it's because Jesus through the power of God and through the aspect of the Holy Spirit, draws them to Christ. Then they give their life to Christ, and then they get baptized. Let us watch Justin as he baptizes one new convert. Well, here uh, we have our sister in Christ, uh, Alyssa Johnson, and so before her family and friends and everyone here at Glenville, uh, Alyssa, my sister, do you believe that Jesus Christ is your Savior and your Lord? I do. You do. And today you'd like to identify with him in believer's baptism? I do. All right. All right. So because of that, it is my privilege to baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in the newness of life. Amen. Baptism. It is an outward profession, as I am not ashamed of Jesus Christ. I have been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. I have listened to him. He has wooed me into his family. I have accepted his grace, his forgiveness. Now I can stand in front of a body of believers and say, I am a follower of Christ. Amen. There's not a better expectancy of God's power than watching somebody give their life to Christ and follow the Lord in believer's baptism. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. None of us would ever have thought, to pray to God 
unless God put that spark of need of a deeper soul than what we have. You know, when we talk about we forget it's an invitation. Sometimes we forget it's an invitation that God wants to talk to us. So we go days, weeks, months, and years and not talk to God. And then we wonder why chaos is taking place. And then at the end of this chaos, when we get the revelation that, you know, I need to make a change, we get this revelation that maybe God can change us. And the greatest thing about God changing us is he can change us. He can miraculously change us and change us instantaneously. But he wants our will to desire him. But where do we begin? We don't know where to begin. We haven't prayed for so long and we feel like our prayers are empty, so what do we do? In Romans chapter 8, verse 26, likewise the Spirit also helps us in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And can I tell you, I, I believe one of the sweetest times when somebody's going through a major issue within their life. They're hurt, or their family member's hurt. They've got some major calamity that takes place within their life, and, and they're in a setting, or maybe it's in the office or in their church. And uh, they come to the altar, and I say, can I pray with you? And tears are coming down their face. And they just shake their head. I don't know what to do. I can't pray. Words are not working. I don't know what to think. I don't know what to say. I, 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 I don't pray. And I, I'm lost. I'm, I'm out of place. I'm in a place where I'm not used to. I'm not used to coming to a church. But all of a sudden, God told me to come down here. I don't have the words to say. And all I'm doing is I'm a blubbering child crying in front of all these people. You know what prayer that is? That's a prayer of expectancy, of trusting that the Holy Spirit of God will take her heart and her mind, not the words out of her mouth, but the words in her heart, and the Holy Spirit will usher those pure, unspoken words to the very throne of God. That is words that cannot be uttered. That's a prayer that God says, I want you to hear my heart. It's not necessarily the words. I'd rather take somebody that don't really know how to pray, and so broken that they can't pray, and just spend time with me in quiet, quiet, humbled prayer. When you say, I don't know how to pray, it's not the long prayers. It's not the verbiage in your prayers. It's the condition of your heart while you pray. And you have the right condition of your heart, understanding, I really don't know this whole thing. I don't really know why, but I understand the Spirit also will help us in the midst of our prayers. And then sometimes you don't know how to begin. I love this verse when somebody says, I don't know how to begin. Romans chapter 5, verse 8 is a wonderful place to start in your prayer. But God demonstrates his love towards us. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Wow. What a great place to start. And if you read that for the very first time, and you're a new believer, and you heard what God demonstrates his love toward us, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, I would have to say, thank you. You, you gave to me eternal life. I... I couldn't have this without you. That is a motivator that I can expect God to do greater things with me if he died for me. He gave to me eternal life. Thank you. The greatest ingredient in prayer is adoration and thanksgiving. Lord, thank you. Lord, thank you for taking care of me because I know you know if you take care of this issue, I can take care of that issue. I'm going to give every issue to you. It was humble adoration, but God demonstrates his love toward us while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. And then the fourth is, we don't want to have self-acknowledgement in our prayer or be self-aware, if you would say it that way. If you have... Um, 
shoes on that you don't want to get stepped on, you might want to raise your feet up a little bit. Proud people have a hard time with prayer. Proud people think, I don't need God. Proud people say, I've got this one on my own. When we don't pray, what we are saying, I don't need God. And when we say, I don't need God, God, the heart of God is broken. I believe when we say we don't need God, we are too proud. And we look down on people, and we never look up at God. And we never see God because we're so busy looking at ourselves and looking at other people and judging and criticizing others, we cannot see God's hand working. And as long as we are criticizing negativity and proud, we will never ask God to work within our life. We need to be self-aware. And the only way that we can be self-aware is understand that I need God. I don't just want God. I don't want the Christianity part of Christ. I need God. I don't want to just come to church and, and do my duty and, and do everything that God tells me I have to do and go home and, okay, I put my time in. Prayer, with the expectancy of prayer, is the power of God. When we are humbled, we can ask God, and then God will break us. He'll break us to a point that he will see within us so he can show us where we have failed. See, pride people, prideful people have a hard time with self-evaluation. Oh, I, I, I can tell you what you're doing wrong, and somebody can tell everybody else what you're doing wrong, but sometimes, looking at myself, I'm pretty good if you're the judge. But if God's the judge, I don't measure up quite as well. But when we look at what God truly wants for us, we see God's hand within our life. I like it what Isaiah said. Isaiah said something in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 5. When Isaiah was praying to God, the first thing that he said was, woe is me. Listen to this, verse 5. So I said, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people with unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts, as so holy he is, I am a man of of unclean lips. When you pray and you sense who God is, you don't look at God and say, oh, how awesome you are. The first thing that we do is fall on our face and say, how loathsome I am. Moses, Isaiah looked at that and he said, he said, I, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy to even look in the face of God. I am a man of unclean lips. I'm a man that should not even talk to God, but God loves us he forgives us, and he wants to move on. So right away, he senses the sin within his life. A brighter light will always, always, always show us our sin. And that bright light is God's word, and that bright light is God's prayer. It's a way we don't pray. It's why we don't pray, because sometimes we do not want God to show us what we're doing wrong. There's times in our life when we go to church or we go to events or, or maybe even just in our family time where the enlightenment of God's word has, has brought to us our attention of a sin or an attitude or an issue within our life. And when that sin is brought to light, what do you do with it? Let, let's throw a couple out there. What happens when we find out, we, this is a new revelation, but what happens when we find out that we are a gossip? That we're talking about somebody that really shouldn't be talked about. None of their business, none of your business. But somebody confronts you on that. What do you do with that? Ah, I'm not hurting anybody. The Bible calls it sin. If it's sin, it's sin. And you know it's sin. What do we do with that? What about being rude? What about getting mad? What about having issues within your life that's contrary to God's word and you find out it's wrong? When sin is exposed to the light, what God has asked us to do to be holy 
is to give that sin to him that he's already died for. And as we offer that sin to God that he's already died for, then he takes that sin and he says this, I have forgiven you. I love you unconditionally. I am going to ask you to work on those issues, give you tools to work on those issues. When you know it is sin, stop it. We need to change our attitude to change our life. Prayer is humbling. Prayer is hard. But prayer can change you. We have worked too hard to stop now. When you think about prayer, I want to change the way that we think about prayer. Prayer with expectancy delivers power. Not words out of our mouth. Why are we praying? What is the purpose behind this prayer? Are we just praying for dinner? Or are we praying to an almighty God, a supernatural God, that can change everything about us? Prayer is not words. Prayer is a condition of the heart to the power of the almighty God. And this is the one that everybody says to me. We don't pray because we think our prayers go unanswered. I just don't see God working. I just don't know what God is trying to do. Are you experiencing unanswered prayer? Does God sometimes in your heart turn a deaf ear to some of your desperate pleas of healing, finances, or protection? We all experience irritation sometimes with our best effort of communication and when the results are unsatisfactory. Or worse, the response are always no. We wonder, did we ever receive the message? When we pray, we often equate the lack of immediate, tangible results with God rejecting our prayers. When we pray, sometimes we feel like God is going to give to us a magic pill. Take this pill, tomorrow it'll be okay. You say this prayer, supernaturally God's going to change everything about you. When you go to work, your boss is going to be perfect. You take this pill, your wife is going to be nice to you in the morning. You take this pill and you go to the bank, you're going to have thousands of dollars in the bank. Well, prayer works, but prayer doesn't work like that. You know what prayer does? Prayer changes our heart, not their heart. Prayer, what it does, it allows us to bring glory to God and it puts us in the proper perspective. Listen to what James chapter 5 verse 13 and 16 says. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing songs. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over them, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of the faith will save the sick. And the Lord will raise him up, and all that has committed his sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you might be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Prayer works. When you're hurting, he says pray. If God didn't ask us to pray, prayer would not be important. But all through the scriptures, it talks about prayer. It talks about prayer. It may not be a outward ver uh, verbal prayer that you say in front of hundreds of people. Because God wants us to have an internal prayer. Prayer is actively knowing God is the source of all power and trusting in that answers, whether it's expected or unexpected, will accomplish greater things. Whether it's what you think is right or what you need. See, This is not a prosperity gospel sermon here by any means. God doesn't want to make you happy. And sometimes you asking for your wish list, it would make you very happy temporarily. But if what he gives to you makes you happy temporarily, but makes you lose him as a focus within your life, and it makes you sin because of what he gave to you, he knows all and he knows what you would do, so he cannot give to you what is not going to be best for you. God wants you holy, not happy. God wants you to focus on him and give him glory, not 
necessarily to be happy. Sometimes we pray when we're sad, we want to feel better. We want to have a, a, a good spirit. And God says he wants to give to us a joyous spirit. Joy is deep within our soul, a God-given joy that I'm doing what God wants me to do. A joyful spirit. Sing a joyful noise unto the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. When we have an inner joy, that's when we understand what God is doing. It's not making me happy. Happy is circumstances. You can be happy today, but a phone call today will make you very unhappy. But if you have joy within your spirit, the phone call today, oh, it may be troubling. But the first place you go is on your knees, and the joy that God has given to you in your soul can remain during calamities. Emotion, anger, frustration, oh, those things are real. Joy comes from God. A real believer that has a faith in God, that has an expectancy in his prayer, that joy will not leave. Joy is important. John chapter 14, verse 13. And whatever you ask in my name, that is what I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Whatever you ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Everything that we ask for must be God's glory. It must give God the glory. What does God want to complete through prayer? In John chapter 16, this is my last verse. John chapter 16. And in that day, you will ask me nothing, most assuredly. And I say to you, whatever you ask of my Father in my name, he will give you. Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive. And your joy may be full. Your joy may be full. God wants to bring every person face to face to our deepest need. What is it? What is your deepest need? What is it that you're afraid to pray to? What is it that you're afraid that if I ask God for this, he'll deliver this, it'll make me change, it'll make me do something I really don't know what I want to do, and if I humble myself before God, there's a life change that may take place, and I really don't know if that life change is what I'm ready to do. God's will. It's not something that's out there in Wonderland. It's in your soul. And God wants us to be open and transparent before him, praying with, expect with expectancy that God will give to us the power and the favor. Now, the night before Jesus was betrayed, he went into the Garden of Gethsemane and he prayed. He was about a stone's throw away from his other disciples. And he got on his knees before God. And he said this, Father, if this cup could pass from me, let it be. He didn't want to go through the agony and the pain of the cross. That was his flesh. That was his humanity. But it is deity, he said this. But I really want to do what you want me to do. Not my will, but thy will be done. There's a point in our life that we have to say, God, what is it that you want? What path do you want me to take? What decisions do I need to reevaluate? What life lessons do I need to say? It's not about me. It's about him. It's not about your will. It's about his will. And when we get to the point that Jesus talked to the Father, the same day we talked to the Father, what is it, Lord, that you want me to do? And then we take God's word, his word, and we apply God's word to our prayer. God cannot bless Anything that goes against his word. He can't. Because God's word is absolute truth. So when we say, Lord, I want, I need, I think, but it's against God's word, God is saying, oh, your, your self-evaluation is not on target. Why don't we look to what the Bible says and then pray as God would give you glory and then God could answer your biggest needs. God's will, not thy will. How do we know God's will? God's word. So the two biggest aspects 
of our Christian faith is our prayer with, expect with expectancy. Pray that he will take care of it, love it, and give us power. And then know the word of God because those two go hand in hand. So my challenge is very simple. Why don't we pray? Why don't you pray? Oh, we go through the motions. We pray at night. We pray in the morning. We pray at church. All those outward prayers are fine. You know what he really wants? He wants a quiet, simple, alone time with you and him. No distractions. Nobody else there. Whether you're driving down the road or whether you're laying in the bed, whether you kneel beside the bed or whether you're doing something, it's just focus, me and him. Being self-aware of, Lord, what is it that I'm doing that's keeping me from doing what you want me to do? Be honest. Prayer is brutal on pride people, but it's awesome on righteous people that say, I just want you to work within my life. And when we break the pride down and we listen to God and we can open up our heart, he can give us the very desires of our hearts. Because his will is the main purpose within your life. Now, how can I say that? Well, if you're a believer in Jesus, if you've given your life to Christ, you've bowed your knee before him and even been into the baptismal waters, you're not your own. You've been bought through the blood of Jesus Christ. You are a child of God. You have no right to yourself. You are his. You have a right to be an ambassador to Jesus Christ. An ambassador means you speak for Christ. You don't speak for yourself. If you're a child of God, you've been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. Your salvation is secure. Your eternity is secure. And salvation is given to you and eternity is yours. That is a believer. If you're not a believer, you can pray all you want. The first prayer that God's going to hear from you is salvation. And if you've never given your heart to Christ, you've never offered up a prayer, pray to God today and ask God to forgive you. He will wrap his arms around you and he will forgive you today and he will give to you eternity because of your sin will be forgiven and his grace will be given. And then you're a child of God. So why can't you pray? Because you're too proud. Why does God want you to pray? Because he gives grace to the humble. And he exalts the humble because what the humble does, Lord, I need you. I know what you've done for me. And I know what I can't do on my own. And he says, pray. Pray with expectancy. Allow the power of God to work within your life. If you're a child of God and you're struggling, if you're a child of God and you have issues within your life, the first place you need to go to is on your knees before God in prayer, praying that he will change it. Let me rephrase that. That he will change you in order to change it. I wish I had the bottle of magic pills in my office. Here's a magic pill, there's a magic pill, take that and everything's going to be great tomorrow. But you know what? Life is hard. Getting life right is even harder Putting God where he needs to be in the middle of your spiritual life is the most powerful, most awesome thing that you could ever do. But it starts with a humble act of prayer. Taking the earth, our earthly need, taking it to a supernatural God and say, Lord, I need your help. And he says, okay, let's work on that. The greatest counselor that you could ever go to. I need your help. He says, okay, let's start working. Let's start moving. Let's start trying. Let me give you the tools in order for you to get where you need to go. And he's free. He just wants to do it for you. He wants to love you. And he wants to change you. Prayer, we all need to pray. 
It's not an excuse if you're a child of God not to pray. It's not an excuse to think it's all just a duty. It's what I have to do. Prayer should be a delight because your Savior asks you to talk to Him. And He wants to change the circumstances that you are in. Let's go to Lord in prayer. Dear Father, we, this church, us as individuals, we need you. We need the power that you give to us. Lord, we need you to forgive us where we have failed you, where we have taken you for granted, where we have not served you, where we look at life and we say, I can do this on my own. Lord, I pray that you will break our hearts. We want to be like Isaiah and see us and see that we are, are, are broken. We, we, we are nothing. We have no power. We need God. Lord, I pray with that expectancy that we, this church, us as individuals, that we can have your power within our life. We can be so humbled before you that we can pray about everything and we know that you will wrap your arms around us, you will forgive us, you will take care of us, and there's nothing that we can say to you that you do not already know and that you have not already forgiven so we can be honest and transparent about life. And then, Lord, give us the direction. Give us the motivation to move on in our life. And Lord, the most important decision that we can make is to accept you, to give to you our first prayer. And that first prayer is, Lord, forgive me. Forgive my past. Forgive my actions. I accept you as your Lord and Savior. Lord, forgive them. Give to them grace and mercy and peace and forgiveness like you've extended to all of us. But there's always one that needs you. Let this day be the day that that new one becomes our family member because they pray unto you. Lord, thank you for that. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. In prayer, whether it's at the altar or whether it's at your chair, when somebody says, well, it's a time of prayer, it is not a time to stand and wonder. It's not a time to look at somebody that came to the altar and say, I wonder what they're going through. It's a time of holy prayer that we can stand before an almighty God, close our eyes before him. We have enough stuff in our own life that we don't need to worry about what everybody else has, right? Somebody give me an amen. We have an expectancy to our prayer, a power that God wants to change us. And if there's issues within your life, if there's health issues, if there's financial issues, if there's family issues, if there's a personal issue, throne of God is the only place that can fix your life. Let us not be too proud. Let us all be humble and talking to God. And through that humility, he's going to give you grace He's going to give you power, and he's going to change everything about you when you first go to him through prayer.